light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. There are so many fine lines when it comes to distinguishing one thing from another because uh, they're so close, but they're also distinct. And I think it's, it's very important to know the distinctions so that you can tell when it's one and when it's become the other. Uh, one of the things I often speak, uh, speak against, I guess, is narcissism, the idea of the universe revolves around me kind of thing. And as long as I'm okay, everyone else can do whatever, but I'm the only one I'm concerned about is myself. And when I began doing my doctoral studies, I was trying to articulate individuality, and, but I tried to find sources that would uh, describe it in some sort of breath. And all I could find, basically everything I found, I detected was only describing narcissistic individuality decrying individuality as this person who thought everything should be for them and should all be convenient for them, it should revolve around them and so forth. And I put forth in my doctoral writing that the corollary and opposite to that is relational individuality of being somewhat, because every example of individuality I could think of, everyone, uh, it's basically impossible for that for any example of individuality to endure or to be sustained without a constellation of relationships. And which kind of brings me back to that wonderful African word again, Ubuntu. I am because we are and we are because I am. It doesn't negate individuality, it integrates it. That would be relational individuality. Uh, at the present time, however, worse than any pandemic that the humanity has ever faced, uh, I consider that we have a pandemic of the mental illness of narcissism. People focusing on, only on themselves and only what's needed for them to the extent that their relationships become sabotaged because they're not adequately maintaining the constellation of relationships that allow them to be who and what they are and not giving enough to other people. Some people give uh, enormously, and but there are an awful lot of people who are not because they only want what works for them and don't want to be concerned with the rest. It's too too much to deal with. It's too complicated. It's I've got enough to do with my own life. And but what I, I don't know exactly how to say it though. But what they're not seeming to realize is that their own life will not be sustained without that constellation of relationships. That there are grocery store workers and postmen and teachers and telephone operators and a whole list of, you know, even just the, the neighbor next door. I mean, taxi cab drivers, there's a whole list of, of people that without those people there, their lives would grind to a halt and they wouldn't be able to do anything really that they're already doing. Uh, even maintaining, you know, people who depend upon their cars to get them to and from work. And that wouldn't happen if there wasn't a mechanic to make sure that that car stayed in good repair and was available to fix it whenever it broke down. The very close to all this narcissistic attitude of it's all about me, instead of saying it's all about we, it's, it's all of us or none. We, we all have to work together. It's, it's in my humble opinion as a spiritual person, as a person of faith, I think humanity was created to have collaborative relationships, not competitive ones. And the more we get into competition, the more we sabotage the collaborative relationships that could otherwise exist. Very closely aligned with uh, this, um, or one of the effects, I suppose one could even say, of this epidemic of narcissism, of people being self-centered and selfish and not looking out for healthy communities, but looking out for only themselves and then being surprised when the context around them begins to break down because they haven't been doing anything to maintain it. And close to all that is this notion of having uh, attitudes of entitlement or feeling entitled that because of who I am, I deserve this and so. Um, and 
if you forgive me for it, I, I normally avoid this because uh, as a 21st century nun, I feel like I'm supposed to always set the best possible example. Um, but it's, uh, it's a very amusing anecdote I read once. I don't know if it ever actually happened or not. It seems like it might have. Um, and I'll try to be brief here, but there is, uh, the story goes that there's this young woman who's uh, a, a reservation agent at an airport, and there's a long line of people, and she's just working as fast as she can, just, just furiously scribbling forms and moving machines as fast as she can, uh, because none of her other coworkers have shown up that day for whatever reason. And there's this long line of people waiting who all need to get on their plane. And she's set up, you know, I'm going as fast as I can. And they're trying to be understanding. And then this man comes storming up to the front of the line and says, I need to get on that plane right now. And she explains to him very courteously that, well, all these people have been waiting for a while. I've been waiting also. I'm working as fast as I can. I'll be with you as quick as I possible. And and he looks at her with an angry face and says, do you know who I am? And quick thinking, uh, that brilliant young lady that she was, she grabbed a microphone and calls over the PA system. Ladies and gentlemen, we have at the counter a man who does not know who he is. If anyone can help us with this situation, would you please come to the front of the line and help resolve things? Uh, you know, because he wasn't willing to wait in line everything. And, then she, and of course, the whole line breaks up laughing. It breaks the tension, and everyone understands it's stressful. She's doing the best she can, et cetera. And at that point, he looks at her and, using profanity, says, F you. And she very calmly responds, I'm sorry, sir. You'll have to wait in line for that, too. And I, brilliant response for dealing with a volatile situation. Uh, but the point being, she was the one person there who was doing her job. and. It's, it's likely that the managers over her uh, weren't completely doing theirs, or they would have sent more coworkers to help her in that situation. And in spite of all the situations that were oppressing her, she was dedicated to doing the best job she could in spite of all the challenges, and in spite of the fact that she couldn't be superwoman and meet everybody's needs with this, you know, or like a genie, snap her fingers and suddenly everyone would have their tickets. It, she was doing the best she could as a human woman and a dedicated servant and a very professional employee uh, for the airport. And an understanding that she was, uh, there were a lot of things in the system that were oppressing her and that were not supporting her in the way they needed to. And she acknowledged that, but she wasn't in a position to do anything about it. Um, but that was what she acknowledged to, to him at the end of the, of the anecdote also. <clears throat> at the end of the story, that her life wasn't any more perfect, that she had a lot of situations that were pressing her in ways that were really despicable. Um, but in spite of all of them, she had to show up and do her best and give her best and remain calm and professional in the face of overwhelming uh, circumstances. And just I, I if assuming that was the true story, I applaud the the woman who was able to maintain her cool in the, under that much pressure. But what that all I'm trying to bring out in all of that is that there are people who go through life like that man, uh, insisting that because of who they are, that they think everybody should know, that they deserve something other than the usual treatment. And it's not an accommodation based on a disability. It's, it wouldn't be a disability. It would be, they would be requesting an accommodation on the basis of their mental illness of narcissism. That they want other people to accommodate their narcissism and to accommodate their sense of self-importance in ways that would be harmful to everyone else. Instead of operating from a point of uh, equality and that we're all here, we all want this to work out and we're doing the best we can. Uh, but ultimately, a person is a person is a person and everyone matters and it's not about being competitive, it's about being collaborative. And the, 
I guess it's, it's one of the things I don't think I've ever mentioned in any of my shows before, but when I look out at humanity and growing up within a uh, lower middle class, very low middle class family, I guess, my understanding was always that we were all on the same level. Uh, human beings are, uh, in truth, have egalitarian relationships. And as, uh, as I read somewhere, what distinguishes one from another by circumstances is what the author called the accident of birth, that you happen to be born into a family of a particular religion, a particular country, a particular race, and by the accident of birth, you're born where you are and, and thereafter uh, are predisposed to some kind of life, whether it's a rich one or a poor one or whatever. And I guess that always resonated and made a lot of sense with me. Um, it always resonated with me and made a lot of sense that it's, you know, I could have been born as a woman. I could have been born as in a different nationality. I could have been born in, in a different country. It so happened that I was born into a family that in some ways, I remember growing up, people commenting that they thought my father must have a good salary. And I kind of thought, well, not as far as I can tell, but he worked for the Postal Service. And uh, my recollection was that during, the teenage year, during my teenage years, uh, the level he was at was that he was trying to raise five children on a salary of $29,000 a year which at that time I think was lower middle class, but it was, it was kind of between the, the categories uh, in a sense in that we were, uh, his salary was too high for us to qualify for any help, but we were too poor to have anything. Uh, too much to qualify, too little to warrant help. And, and that has described a lot of my life, I guess, where I go through and I do my best and I, I operate in that egalitarian fashion of, that, I, that I learned as a child, that in this agrarian environment where I grew up, it was neighbors helping neighbors anytime, every time, without worrying about the, what the cost was, because ultimately what mattered was our relationships. And, but it, I think the only thing, I don't know that anyone felt entitled to anything uh, except an opportunity to work maybe. Um, because being in an agrarian uh, situation, chores were just a part of life. Um, and, you know, what about a childhood where you just played as a child? Well, I don't remember ever having that because everything was work all the time. And I guess there were some moments where there was uh, moments of playtime in between chores, but I don't remember them, any of them being all that uh, lavish or, or well-equipped or, or well-funded. Um, most of the time we had to find ways to have fun or play or whatever that didn't involve money. And so the world in which I was raised was a world that was not economically obsessed. It couldn't be because there was never enough money to go around. But I have met people since then who seem to view life as a hierarchy, that they are just inherently better than everybody else and that there are good people and bad people and all the different levels and according to what level you're on depends on what you should reasonably expect. And I really take issue with uh, when I was diagnosed with autism and officially became a person with a disability um, that the programs and the circumstances I kept running into always seemed to assume that a person on disability or a person of lower economic uh, of lower economic ability and lower economic resources that somehow we were supposed to put up with less and expect less and not expect uh, everything else everything in life that was granted to everyone in higher economic levels and what even in the churches that I attended as a child there was this idea put forth that Riches were God's blessings, and if you didn't have them, then God wasn't blessing you, um, which I found really peculiar because a lot of the poor people I met and grew up with and, and helped uh, in whatever ways I could were incredibly loving and kind and honest people, but they didn't get paid a living wage for anything they did. Um, they pretty much were expected to put up with less because they were born into 
a lower economic strata. And the, most of the wealthier people that I uh, met along the way seemed to expect that because they were wealthier, they deserved, for whatever reason, I, I don't know what they were basing deserved on, they deserved more opportunities, they deserved more resources, they deserved better food, better clothes, better whatever. And they were the most despicable people. They were dishonest, they were selfish, they were unkind, uh, and I, I, I couldn't put the two together, how you could be that horrible of a person, uh, that untrustworthy and that lazy, and somehow, be, somehow look in the mirror and think that you were God's favorite, uh, that you deserve more than anyone else. I, you know, which is where I come back to saying, I see humanity as egalitarian relationships. And I really don't see anybody as being any better or worse than anyone else, except perhaps in the ways that they have defined their character. Better or worse in the sense of being more honest, more loving, more kind, uh, perhaps having accumulated wisdom along the way, and uh, more willing to help. And being a generous person, not because they wanted to be thought of as a generous person, but because they actually gave things away. Um, yeah, and perhaps a lot of this reflects the agrarian environment in which I was raised. Uh, but every year there was someone who would get hurt in an accident, and because the neighbors counted on each other and on their relationships more than on their money, everyone knew that if that farmer missed one season of getting the crops uh, planted and cultivated and harvested and all that, that they could have such an economic loss that they would wind up losing their farm because they wouldn't be able to pay all their bills and everything. And so on some, it was never announced ahead of time that I ever heard, so I don't know if they knew they were coming or not, but, but it would always be in the evening paper of, the, of our local town. Uh, and this, because some morning they'd be having breakfast and there'd be a rumble in the farmyard and 20 or 30 tractors would show up in the farmyard and they, somebody would call the local newspaper and the reporter would come running with a camera and it was all the neighbors for miles around with all their equipment and they would come in and plow, disc and plant the entire farm in one day, everything. And that was, the, that was how people survived, by counting on each other. And it wasn't about the money, it was about the relationships. And it wasn't that anybody was entitled to anything. They didn't stand there in the yard lording it over their neighbors like they were entitled to this help. It was that their neighbors were choosing to give this help because at some point their neighbors knew that they weren't entitled to anything either. And it might be their turn uh, in the bigger scheme of things to have an accident. Or uh, Farming uses so many machines that it's, it's a very, dangerous kind of profession because you really have to mind your machines and be careful and mind the safety guards and everything because there are so many things that can go wrong. And so they depended upon each other, not upon their money. And it wasn't about feeling entitled, it was about feeling connected. It wasn't about feeling that you're better than everyone else, it was about feeling that you're as good as everyone else and everyone else is as good as you and it's all of us or none, and so it was about collaboration. And that's the environment in which I grew up. The quirky thing about that to me now, though, is that I turned out to be something totally unique and anomalous, and it puzzles me to no end that they don't seem to have a place for me. And I didn't see anything growing up that uh, suggested that anomalous people were in any way, in any way to be excluded. I mean, to this day, everybody knows where the hippie farm is, just nobody knows who lives there, because nobody knows them. But everyone knows where it is, and no one has a problem with them being there. In a similar sort of way, I guess, that created an expectation in me as I grew up. Not that I was entitled to tolerance, but that I could expect tolerance because of the way they treated each other. And when it didn't come, that was very disillusioning to me. But it didn't change the fact that I still believe in egalitarian relationships, in helping anyone I can, whenever I can, and in continuing to be who and what I am with integrity. Because the one thing you could count on from all the neighbors was integrity. 
Thank you for listening. I hope some of the things I've said have been helpful to you. And I guess in conclusion, my summary would be, and now may you be blessed with love and peace in the pursuit of your own dreams and in all your dealings with the diversity of humanity around you. Amen. So many take for granted what gives life to our days. In a single tiny moment, it all could go away. So I celebrate the earth and sky, and I thank God for you. It's the little things that make me smile that help my dreams come true. Without a face to shine upon, Sunlight can't be seen without a place to put its roots. No plant can turn to green without a dream to guide my way. I won't know where I have been without a hand to hold my own. What can love ever mean? The sunlight in the morning, the hope within my heart, the work that is mine to do, it's all a place to start. Here my dog comes running, just happy to be nearby. His sloppy kiss upon my cheek says I'm the reason why. Without a face to shine upon, sunlight can't be seen. Without a place to put its roots, no plant can turn to green without a dream to guide my way. I won't know where I have been without a hand to hold my own. What can love ever mean? The nights I feel alone, but know that God is there, still holding on to me when no one seems to care. Still believing I can be the mystery that was planned before I first set foot on earth and grew to be a man. Without a face to shine upon, sunlight can't be seen. Without a place to put its roots, no plant can turn to green. Without a dream to guide my way, I won't know where I have been without a hand to hold my own. What can love ever mean? The day that is now fading with some things left undone. Some people I still want to meet before my race is run. Some songs I'd like to sing out loud for anyone to hear. And if they'd like to sing along, the meaning will be clear. Without a face to shine upon, sunlight can't be seen. Without a place to put its roots, no plant can turn to green. Without a dream to guide my way, I won't know where I have been. Without a hand to hold my own, what can love ever mean? Hands holding hands can hold the world. Hearts holding hearts can live anew. My hand to yours and your heart to mine can make every dream come true. Hands holding hands can hold the world. Hearts holding hearts can live anew. My hand 
into yours and your heart to mine can make every dream come true. Hands holding hands can hold the world. Hearts holding hearts can live anew. My hand to yours and your heart to mine can make every dream come true.